Hi, and we have a wonderful guest, Lee Steinberg, Yay. which needs very little introduction. <laughs> For sure. But I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Lee, welcome. Hi, Lee. Yeah. Uh, if you've watched the movie Jerry Maguire, there is a real guy behind the story. The story. And that is Lee Steinberg. And he's here right now. And and Lee <laughs> personifies success. Mm -hmm. When Tanya, you brought up Lee's name, Lee, what I, what I thought was, what trauma has he been through? <laughs> Why is he coming on our podcast? <laughs> then, then I got your book. Um, the title is The Agent. And uh, and then I started getting the vision. And so this is going to be a wonderful, epic interview. Yes. And uh, Lee, I just want to kick things off with, um, tell us, we always kind of follow a timeline, you know, and it's just where were you born and what was your child look like? And, and tell us about, you know, where Lee Steinberg came from. So I was born in uh, Hollywood, I grew up in Los Angeles, and uh, I had a father who was uh, into education and later became a, was a teacher or principal, but he had two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to make a meaningful difference in the world and help people who couldn't help themselves. So we were fundamentally hardwired at an early age to believe that we had a responsibility there was a corollary. He used to say, if you're looking for someone to make a change or fix a problem, as minor as picking up trash off the floor and as major as climate change or racism, there's a tendency to wait for they or them to solve the problem, the amorphous they, older people, political figures. And he would say, um, you could wait forever. The they is you, son. You are the they. Mm. So it imbued us with a sense of responsibility. Um, my grandfather ran Hillcrest Country Club, which was the hangout for the entertainment community. And he had uh, lunch every day at a comedian's table, which was uh, Groucho Marx, George Burns, Jack Benny, your younger listeners may not remember these wow. people, but they were all comedic greats, Danny uh, Kay and George Burns and my grandpa took me to my first uh, my first baseball game. Oh, that's cool. And so I had that influence. I I have a picture on Marilyn Monroe's lap. I have a <laughs> Elvis Presley <laughs> autograph guitar uh, from from those. But again, I had a father who went uh, the other direction um away from entertainment to to trying to to help people and he was head of the human relations commission of southern california which had all the different ethnic groups and the whole goal was keeping racial peace so mm -hmm. um i was brought up by ucla parents uh went to ucla my freshman year uh when lou alcinder was the center on the team and uh but it was the late 60s and berkeley was beckoning it was the vortex of every um friend going on with young people in the country it was long hair and tie-dye and um, <laughs> free love and and rock and roll and um so i had to be at berkeley <laughs> I had to be at Berkeley. It's like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know if I I'm can gonna... picture Lee with his long hair and but like bell bottoms and tight eyes. <laughs> my my youngest son uh, starts at UCLA uh, this week, so I'll leave that Berkeley uh, transition <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm, I'm ecumenical. I I'm a big UCLA fan and a big Cal yeah. Berkeley fan. Well, Berkeley's like uh, kind of a cousin, yeah. you know, so yeah. we're all in the same family. <laughs> Actually, just to clarify, UCLA is the younger person uh, institution in the mix. Berkeley's been here <laughs> a since time. 1866, but <laughs> we digress. Yeah. So I'm at Berkeley and I end up student body president and we're demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. The governor is Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And so every time we demonstrate, he cracks down. And I learned everything I needed to learn about the art of negotiating from interacting with Governor Reagan. And 
later on he gave me a humanitarian award when he was president um and we laughed about those days but they weren't that <laughs> funny when you were living in tear gas and and the rest um so i was a dorm counselor in an undergraduate dorm working my way through law school and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm and one of the students uh, was the quarterback, Steve Bartowski. So when I got out of law school in 73, 74, um, I was, the only thing I knew about law was there had been a show called Perry Mason and another show called The Defenders. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I'd be a courtroom lawyer, a DA or a defense attorney. But before I ever got there, Bartkowski in 1975 became the very first pick in the first round of the NFL draft. And he asked me to represent him. Mm. Uh, there I was brimming with legal experience, <laughs> having practiced before. And I had the first pick overall in the draft as a client. And uh, there was... Uh, an alternative football league at that time called the World Football League. So we had some leverage and we ended up getting the largest rookie contract in NFL history. And we flew into Atlanta the night before the signing and there were league lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd was pressed up against the police line and the first thing we heard was we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg, have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live. <laughs> and wow, I looked at him the way, well, the Dorothy looked at Toto when they got to <laughs> Munchkin land and said, I know we're not in California. And I saw the tremendous idol worship and veneration that athletes were held in the communities across the country. And I thought, well, if I would have these athletes go back to the high school community and retrace their roots and set up a scholarship fund or work for a church or boys and girls club, mm -hmm. they could put down roots and enhance the quality of life. And then at the collegiate level, um, my clients like Troy Aikman endowed full scholarship at UCLA and then gave them another million dollars. So it's a way of putting roots down with mm -hmm. the alums and having a series of mentors. And then at the pro level, we challenge each athlete to look inside themselves and think about some problem they'd like to address and uh, set up a charitable foundation with the leading business figures, political figures, and uh, community leaders. And so Warwick Dunn, a former running back, just put the 200th single mother and her family into the first home they'll ever own by making a down payment and moving them in. Or Patrick Mahomes has 15 in the Mahomes, uh, where he helps uh, youth charities, buys kids school lunches, helps with hospitals. But it's athletes making a difference in the world. And I saw that they could be role models and trigger imitative behavior. Mm -hmm. So I had the heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis, the boxer, cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. Mm. And that could do more to trigger behavioral change in rebellious adolescents than a thousand authority figures ever could. So, or trigger, or, uh, Oscar DeLoy and Steve Young prejudices foul play. Mm -hmm. So that started me back in 1975 and and uh, and it it built from there. Wow. And it sure did. It sure did. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd like to I, you you said some by the way, you uh, are being modest. Not only were you the student body president at Berkeley, you won by a three to one margin. I mean, it's kind of a landslide. I, I feel bad for whoever uh, uh, that other folk uh, just person like, was. What's a student the body were. president of the but, entire university? Just but like, wow. I, I love the value system of your family yeah. to cherish relationships mm -hmm. and to have a purposeful life. Mm -hmm. And was that talked about often, or was it? How was that kind of? Uh, uh, 
you know, imparted to to the family? How was that kind of talked about and kind of day to day living within your household? So when you come from an education family, mm -hmm. the values are a little different because people have made a conscious choice to turn away from the business world mm -hmm. to to share their life with kids. And uh, so money was never really discussed as a metric or measure of success, but making a difference in other people's lives did. And the question was, could you feel the pain? Could you understand that other people have it much worse in a variety of different ways? Mm -hmm. And it was the sense of proportionality that later saved me, that that I didn't have the last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany in the late 30s. But we had a family club called the Muddenhead Club. And we met weekly, and we used Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, we had a president, a vice president, a treasurer, a sergeant at arms. And we learned <laughs> problem solving at a very early uh, point. Um, we were taught how to listen and draw out another human being and cut below the stereotypic surface that you might perceive and peel back the layers of the onion and so that we would understand someone's deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. If you can put yourself in the other person's heart and mind and see the world the way they see it, it's possible to navigate your way through life uh, easily and create win-win scenarios where parties both walk away happy. So. We learn from an early age how to problem solve, mm -hmm. um, how to have disputes and um, and settle them, that you could um, talk about someone's behavior and how it impacted you, but not them as a person. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't say never and always when describing someone else's behavior and never to go to bed with a dispute or anger and wake up the next morning, like everything's fine. Mm. Those are, I love those value yeah, systems. We, too. we, you know, it, we just got to talk more about that yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, churches are kind of in general on the decline. That's where a lot of people pick up on those kind of messages, yeah. but I think we need to do everything we can to just keep that, those kind of conversations going. But what what's You're interesting blessed. about you, Lee, is that a lot of the folks that come in here, and appear on our show are, you know, mega successes, you know, in terms of being, a, you know, we have a rock star coming in next week, we have Oprah guests, we've had a whole parade of really dynamic uh, guests. But what's distinctive about you is a lot of these folks come in and went through hell in their childhood, mm -hmm. and, you know, absolute, you know, abuse, horrific, horrific abuse, and then they rose above it. But you're born into, um, it sounds like a family with a lot of love, a lot of mm -hmm. uh, curiosity, a lot of respect. positive respect, mm -hmm. you know, just these wonderful value systems mm -hmm. and where we're going to, you know, go at, at some point, you know, is kind of interesting because it's kind of the flip of what we often hear. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, I think your story too, and we'll get to that, but it just shows you that anybody can have, you know, we all grow up in different childhoods and you never know where you come from, what can, you know, come in the future. You yeah. just never know. Yeah, you, you're you definitely blessed. I always thought that, oh, I have such a great family. We sit at the kitchen table, we talk. And my dad would walk in, he'd see all the girls around the kitchen table. He would, he would like to do a <laughs> <new> turn, <laughs> but listening to you, I'm like, wow, you know, we never really, we never sat down and did the things, you know, that you grew up with, with your family. You're, you're blessed in that, in that aspect for yeah. sure. Yeah. So we learned those skills. So yeah. I ended up student body president of my high school, my college, my junior, high, my, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it just it's it seemed natural and i led a very charm life um there really wasn't a field of sports agentry when i started um teams didn't have a collective bargaining agreement that meant they had to honor representation so they could just slam the phone down and say we don't deal with agents mm -hmm. and so um 
by the end of it in football, what had 64 first round draft picks in the very first in football and the very first pick in the first round eight different times and 12 players in the Hall of Fame. And then a big baseball practice, a big basketball um, uh, practice, uh, boxing, Olympic stars. Um, but along the way, what was more important, what my dad was more proud of is the fact that um, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, and I set up a program called Adopt a Minefield, where you could demine in Angola and Mozambique and Cambodia and take those toxic um, uh, landmines out of there in a way where you could restore the land or funding a, a program in the 30 biggest cities across the country that um, fought, taught people how to do intelligence work, spot white supremacists mm. and skinheads and uh, intervene in crisis situations and then go into school systems and promote ethnic diversity. So that was how I sort of always measured ourselves. And then the athletes in aggregate have raised almost a billion dollars for a myriad of potpourri of different causes. Yeah. So was, by the way, what was the, what was the, uh, your dad, what did your dad do? What kind of work did he do? He was um, principal at uh, Fairfax High School in okay. Los Angeles and uh, LeConte Junior High in uh, Hollywood. And then he, his doctorate was on the Human Relations Commission. So just so you feel a little better, my parents had five degrees between them from UCLA. <laughs> they met on the Daily Bruin. My dad was sports editor. My mom was managing uh -huh. editor. So I was grew up. All I knew about as a young kid was UCLA sports. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I feel, I feel better. Like, it's in your DNA. Well, but uh, what I love is it, it sounds like the atmosphere in your home was keeping our eye out for people, even on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. And how can we make it an improvement? Because we don't see a lot of landmines. I'm, I'm sure that on the way in here today, nobody drove by no. a landmine. <laughs> but, you know, having been to Israel, I once pulled up at the Dead Sea where you park to go to the Dead Sea. And the sign right in front of me was don't cross this point. It's a it's a landmine field. Wow. So this is a real reality for people. And your family, is, it seems to me, has empathy and concern for people on the other side of the world mm -hmm. that are facing problems we don't we don't Good see. see. Well, I, so one of my brothers, John, became went into the State Department and became an Africa expert. And he was ambassador to Angola and brokered a, tried to broker a peace accord with these in the middle of a civil war. Um, and uh, uh, worked very closely with Colin Powell and, and Madeleine Albright um, and has done some amazing work. So it's how we would take those principles was really our, uh, uh, took us in different directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like a nice Southern California, yeah. wonderful family, yeah. uh, wonderful value system, uh, great education, emphasis on education. Um, and uh, so you you had a nice foundation in life, both with your family. And then when you went to Berkeley, you both, uh, you got an undergrad and then you went to law school and with a law degree. And so you started life really, uh, you know, with a, a really solid foundation. Yeah. And let's be clear. Yeah. Um, I didn't have my first drink till college. Hmm. And there were, we were a very straight generation. There wasn't, um, uh, we didn't know anything about marijuana till we got to college. We didn't, you know, there was uh, no meth or mm -hmm. anything else. Our drugs in college were drugs of exploration. Mm -hmm. But my point was, I didn't, um, uh, I really didn't know much about drinking until I got to college. And then I was one beer Steinberg. So, uh, <laughs> so I had many long years of, of you know, relative sobriety uh, before uh, uh, it all crashed down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now was, let's, let's talk about 
what happened that led you to that spot? Yeah. So it was never anything in my work life. I would go into the office expecting that notwithstanding our greatest preparation uh, and anticipation, problems would arise that would be seem unsolvable. And so I was prepared for that. And that wasn't stressful. It wasn't the fact I was traveling or the work pace or anything. But in my private life, I felt a real sense of responsibility. So the first thing that happened in the uh, in the 2000s was that my two boys were diagnosed with retinitis mm. pigmentosa, which is an eye disease that leads to blindness that is incurable. Mm. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm supposed to be the father. I, uh, there's got to be a way I can figure out a cure. And that was probably grandiose. And then my father, who was a central figure and a real rock in my life, um, died a long death of uh, of uh, esophageal cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was painful. And again, I thought there has to be something I could do. Um, and then we lost a house in, in Newport Beach to mold. And we had to move out within um, a day. And our dream house, we ended up knocking to the ground. Mm. And then I started to experience problems in my marriage. So mm. I felt like um, all this is happening around me and and I can't seem to control it. I, I can't save my kids, save my father, save my marriage, uh, uh, produce a, a home we could live in. And uh, I turned to alcohol as a numbing device. And when I eventually split up with my wife, I had never really drank a lot except late at night. Um, but all of a sudden I found out when I moved on my own, which was the only time I'd lived on my own, um, that, that it was legal to consume alcohol while it was light outside. Mm. <laughs> which I, I had never done. I know. And I um, so I could get a pretty good uh, alcohol level going then. Uh, so I evolved from one beer Steinberg to, to um, uh, you know, to drinking and there started to be consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I, in your book, and I, uh, again, I'm referring to the agent, I recommend everybody gets it that, um, I read where when you're you were very, very close to your dad, it was mm -hmm. quite clear from reading the book that you had a, a really strong bond with your father. And yet when he passed away, if I remember what you said correctly, you said that uh, you didn't cry, you bottled up inside and that you had kind of conditioned yourself over the years when things happen with the challenges of with your with your children's health and eye uh, problems and your father's a uh, long illness and your marriage that you tended to mm -hmm. just bottle up inside, which is, and Tanya and I have talked about this at length, is the quintessential mistake. I've made it personally. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have, and I love the way you articulated it in your book, how, um, how that, despite the great affection and love for your dad, you had bottled that, that pain up. Well, I was also the oldest son. So and had a lot of responsibility for um, uh, the funeral and getting through mm -hmm. the period. And I felt like I needed to be strong for my mother and my brothers and and be the strong figure yeah. and, and get us through it. But that was a mistake because I didn't expiate the grief mm -hmm. and um, it it became destabilizing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I eventually got to the point where I realized I had a problem. And um, so I closed up my office and gave the practice to the younger agents. And um, I had had a virtually unspendable amount of money and uh, divorce started to, to deal with that. I wanted to make sure that my wife had the resources to 
always be able to take care of our, our boys. And so all of a sudden, I didn't have money. I didn't have an office. I went back and moved into my parents' house in West Los Angeles. And I was sitting on my father's bed, my deceased father's bed. And my only thought was, where can I find more vodka? Mm. My world had been reduced to that. Mm. And, um, mm. you know, I'm sitting in the park at, uh, near my parents' home in, in uh, Rancho Park. And I, I had no other thought than how I could keep drinking. Wow. How old were you at this time, at this point? 61. 61. And so the the this was after the Jerry Maguire movie, is my, if my oh, chronology is this right. This is um, um, fifteen years after Jerry Maguire. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And by the way, this is a uh, somebody asked, where did the name Jerry Maguire come from? Uh, do you know? <laughs> no, uh, you know that's it was Cameron Crowe's, uh, you know, fictitious characterization. Yeah, and. Um, <laughs> but I, I spent a year and a half with him, taking him through the world of uh, sports agentry and telling him uh, stories. So I was sitting in in uh, my parents' house, and finally I had an epiphany that I'd been brought up with these core values. And again, I wasn't a starving peasant in Darfur. I was failing to either be a consistent, stable parent, and I was non-functional in terms of the ability to keep going with community and charitable programs. Mm -hmm. So um, what was I doing? Mm -hmm. And and it just struck me that I wasn't, again, didn't have my last name in Nazi Germany. I wasn't sick in any way. What excuse did I have not to do this? So. The first step in all this is to break denial, because mm -hmm. as we know, uh, addiction is a problem that tells you you don't have a problem. <laughs> and so denial, denial. So the okay. first thing is to just uh, surrender. So I went to a series of rehabs. Um, one of them was uh, back at Harvard, and it was like, this is some time ago, it was $10,000 a day. So it was, uh, uh, and I went to some great rehabs and I learned everything about the dysfunctional alcoholic family and the uh, uh, being uh, uh, ahedonic and brain chemistry and, 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 and the search for dopamine and, mm -hmm. and how my brain had been rewired. I learned it all. I just couldn't stop drinking. Mm. Did and, addiction run in your family? Hmm? Did addiction run in your family? No. no, no. Like I said, there was, I don't remember alcohol in our house. I don't, I it certainly wasn't drugs when I was young and no, I'm, um, I'm a mutant. You're the uh, first. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, see my drug was achievement. Mm -hmm. All right. In other words, it was for years and years, it was achievement. It was just signing more players, creating more charitable programs, you know, saving uh, uh, sports teams from moving out of their city. Um, it was just writing books, uh, working on movies. It was just achievement. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, um, that I was using alcohol to numb myself, so um, I had to break denial. And the only thing that worked for me was a unique fellowship with the 12-step program. Um, and I went off to Sober Living and worked a 12-step program, got a sponsor, um, and uh, found a home group and, um, and worked the 12 steps in order. And I had a sponsor, had a sponsor. And um, it was a bit like like uh, the Greek uh, legend uh, Sophocles, who pushes a big boulder up a hill. 
And every time you push the boulder, it, it moves a little bit, but then it rolls back mm -hmm. and it moves a bit. And there was so much detritus and destruction I'd done. I was like five million dollars in debt, um, and uh, uh, and I couldn't do this privately. So any aberration, if I if I drove drunk, it was going to be a headline story, uh, mini <laughs> headline story in the Times and the Register and around the world. So, um, um, so it required a sense of optimism, a belief that there was light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I'd come from a family where, you know, if there was a, you went into a barn and there was a pile of uh, pony uh, defecation, <laughs> there must be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> so, um, so I, I heard in that unique fellowship uh, uh, messages of hope that life could be better. Mm -hmm. And even though it seemed uh, dark and foreboding, um, I just had to keep plugging. And, and I realized in this time that I had told people so many times that it'd be different this time. This time I understood. This time I had it. And it wasn't purposeful lying. It was just that um, I, my brain had changed and, mm -hmm. I, uh, and the cravings were so strong. So uh, this time I did none of that. I just stacked up days of sobriety because I knew that nobody really wanted to hear any of my uh, pledges or promises, what they wanted to see was action. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a matter of stacking up uh, days and days. And then at the end of that, what was I going to do? My comeback, as it were, is being a stable, loving father and making a difference uh, in the world but mostly sustaining sobriety. Mm -hmm. And uh, the business part of it I knew would be challenging because at a certain age, I don't have a divine right to represent athletes. Um, and they would ask me, I knew, can you promise us that you'll stop drinking? Can you promise us you'll never relapse? Um, you're getting a little long in the tooth, you know, um, uh, you've been out of this profession for a while, you know, you couldn't manage your own money correctly. How can you manage ours? I, I had to prepare myself mm -hmm. for the fact that I was going right back into what I've done for now. It's been 48 years is uh, a similar thing, which is the, Competing for professional athletes was a hyper competitive profession with thousands of people competing for every athlete. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how could I ever um, get going again? Mm -hmm. But I found a group of investors in Houston, Texas, the ball places. It happened that I was friends with uh, Earl Campbell, who's an iconic running back in the state of Texas. I took him to the investor meeting. And, and I found a group that looked at me as a distressed uh, 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 property. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and they agreed to a valuation for a new company of $10 million and uh, started to, to represent athletes again. And the first breakthrough was 2016, where I represented a first round quarterback. And then um, the year after that, um, found a young quarterback from Texas Tech named Patrick Mahomes, who quickly became most valuable player in the league and won a Super Bowl and went right to the top. And uh, another quarterback to a Tongo by Loa. And we, we built Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. I mean, you're... I guess what's fascinating is that you were one beer Steinberg and that went on for years. Uh, you didn't have alcohol in the home. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, alcohol 
you know, it's just not a problem in social drinking is not a problem. Mm -hmm. I think the majority of people are kind of in that category. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're at UC Berkeley as a student body president. And again, not an issue. I'm really kind of what I'm where I'm going is I'm curious about more about the transition where you went from the one beer guy to was it a gradual thing? Or was it describe that process of of alcohol going from uh, a nothing issue to really kind of taking you mm -hmm. in, a, in a wrong way. So as these problems were building, what I would do is drink late at night by myself mm. and usually vodka. And so that limited, uh, you know, I wasn't going to leave the house to go buy more <laughs> alcohol. You know, a negated community with a with an alarm. <laughs> yeah. and front. That, you know, I was married with with kids, so so it, I'm not saying that was a great pattern, but that was that. But when I went off and lived in my first apartment by myself, the whole structure of uh, of of life changed mm -hmm. and. And I found out again, uh, and, and I started drinking during the day, not every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I still went in the office and, and it was functional. So that was the confusing thing. I was still running a huge business and was pretty functional. But by the end, I started missing some days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had a DUI and a drunken public and all the feedback from that one of the things is that um i mean how cool to my kids to make them grow up and go to school reading about their father in in the mm -hmm. newspaper there was a, a day when i got arrested for drunk driving where i was home uh the next day and i thought you know what i want to get away from all this so i'm going to watch the sport so I turned on uh, Channel 2 in Los Angeles, and they're talking about uh, the Dodgers. And then all of a sudden, I see my face. Oh, geez. And then, so I thought, well, all right, let's turn the channel to Channel 4. <laughs> and once again, there oh. I am. And there's a camera crew over at the Balboa Boa Bay Club that is, because um, uh, I hit a, a fire hydrant. And which I now own, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> a trophy. But um, I had a fire Maybe. hydrant, so now I turn to Channel Seven, and they have a camera crew out there, like at the fire hydrant point, you know, and they're filming this, like you know, who am I, President Obama? But um, <laughs> at any rate. There we went, and then I turned on ESPN, and it was the same thing. So I mm. couldn't escape uh. it anywhere, and um, um, it at a certain point, I was in. After my marriage and divorce, I was in a relationship with a really lovely woman who I thought I'd ultimately marry, and eventually, she thought the kindest thing she could do was force me to deal with you know with my problems mm. mm -hmm. so uh that was it but but again the structure and stability mm -hmm. of living with a family or living in a dorm or an international house or uh wherever it was was just gone and um i lost my way it yeah. seems I'm wondering when you when you mentioned you moved back home in West LA with your family. <clears throat> excuse me. My guess is that you were lonely. Was that kind of a lonely experience for you that added to the desire to drink more? Or am I got that wrong? No, you have that right. It was um, there were no restraints. I mean, I had lived such a productive life and. Uh, and been a good father mm -hmm. um, uh, with my kids and was very focused on the fact that I knew those kids were only going to be that age once. Mm -hmm. And so, 
as my kids grew, I made sure to get back for every soccer game. I, w- I was there for Indian guides and Indian princesses. Um, oh. You know, I, I was there to play with them at night. And um, so, right, it was, at that point, my mother had had a stroke. So she had a helper living in our family home. But that was my cast of characters. And eventually, my brother intervened, my middle brother, and uh, took me off to Sober Loving. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Matter of fact, I went to a place called Charlie Street. Oh, that's which, a hardcore one. Which is indigent, but they didn't have a bed. So yeah. So I went off to, uh, I had the ignominious distinction of not being able to get into uh, indigent rehab. <laughs> and so, but I went off to a sober living house and lived there from March of 2010 to December. And, um, you know, got, got stable. I just threw anything I could do. You know, I went, I went to the, the desert powwow, which is <laughs> a big, uh, event in that fellowship. I went to the uh, local convention. Then I went to San Antonio for the uh, for the the worldwide convention. Uh, I read every book, I uh, anything anybody, and and I listened at meetings to to the wisdom people had to share. Like I was back at college, mm-hmm. and I just realized, you know, I'd always been the expert. I was the one they went to for advice. I was the one that that gave people life advice. And now I was in a situation <laughs> where I had absolutely no understanding of what had happened to me. Yeah. And, yeah. And what I could do. So I better listen. Yeah, exactly. And you were mentioning structure and structure is so critical, especially with people, you know, battling with any kind of addiction and newly in recovery or sober living structure is critical. You know, obviously I've attempted a suicide. I've written a book about it. I'm um, actually, I attempted to, and I notice every single time I fell off my routine, I'd, I'd relapse like into like depression or maybe I'd, I'd pick up that glass of wine again, but I knew every single time, like if I didn't wake up at the same time, if I didn't make my bed, the first thing, right? It's like, that's in your book. Yeah. We had a guest on, um, cause I was really curious about that where it's like, you know, if you can make your bed the first thing in the morning, it's like your major, major, you know, accomplishment. And Fasto was here, one of our guests who's been in recovery, I think for eight years, I think yeah. six or eight years. And he was, he said that the day that I don't make my bed, it gives me permission to slack in every other area of my life. Mm. So that structure and making that bed first thing in the morning is critical for people in recovery. So I heard a message like this, that if you're hungry, eat. If you're uh, lonely, uh, call a friend. If, if you're uh, angry, um, calm down. Mm-hmm. If you're tired, go to sleep. Halt. None of those have to be connected with drinking. And and one of the things I saw in the meetings and the fellowships that I went to was people that were dealing with problems so severe where they were losing a kid uh, to drugs or they they had cancer or they had these horrific problems but they weren't drinking them. Mm-hmm. So you're able to see that. And um, and then I heard that if you would ever stop, start drinking again, there'd be a pilot light internally that would take you right back to your worst moments. You mm-hmm. wouldn't start gradually all over again. Mm-hmm. So um, um, I heard some great messages. I had some great teachers. Uh, I certainly didn't uh, get this far in recovery by myself. I had loads of help um, from friends uh, and different people reaching out that helped me economically and helped me in a variety of ways. And uh, I saw for the first time how easy it would be to become homeless, how 
how tender that bond is between being a high functioning person in society and it all uh, tipping over. Yeah, I, I want people to kind of mm -hmm. understand what's what's going on here. Here you are, Lee Steinberg, you know, born into a, sounds like a really wonderful family, mm -hmm. wonderful values, you know, UCLA, then you transfer over to Berkeley, you know, law degree, and then uh, you're the student body president. I mean, this is just uh, personifying success. Mm -hmm. Then you become a sports agent. And, you know, you're doing this deal and that deal, the whole world, you know, starts to know who you are, and you're coming up all the time. And then you're accustomed to a life with limousines and private jets and and the rich and famous and you're, I read somewhere that you had Robin Leach, uh, Lifestyles of the Rich yeah. and Famous cover your wedding or some, something like that. <laughs> right. Is that right? I mean, this is like me yes. mega, mega success mm -hmm. where alcohol was never a problem. Mm -mm. And then, you know, there's these issues with losing your dad. The marriage is rocky. Your kids have these health problems. And it morphs into this, this alcoholism, really, mm -hmm. uh, that, that takes you down to a point where uh, there's no more limos, there's no more private jets, and you know you're you're scratching for change out of the ashtray, right? <laughs> to, to buy a hot dog. I mean, I'm you know that, that, making that up, but it's. But, but let's be clear. That, yeah, that part of it, I was never dependent on. Um, in other words, I, yes, I took private jets. Yes, I had limousines. Yes, we lived in Newport Coast and in a house where you could see from Laguna Beach to downtown and all that. But I wasn't dependent on those things, mm -hmm. you know, because I had grown up where there were five of us um, in a little house with one bathroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was a teacher. And when when um, our jeans wore out, we put patches on them mm -hmm. and we put taps on the bottom of our shoes so they wouldn't wear out. And, you know, we collected grease and bottles and all that stuff. I always felt fine about that, but I was never dependent on that, nor I'd also been taught not to get dependent on newspaper clippings and external adulation mm -hmm. that, that this was our real life, the three of us sitting here and that's real life and and all that public profile is ephemeral you know it 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 it's it could go away even if you put your name on a building you're not giving yourself yeah. eternity <laughs> right so that part i was always balanced on nice. and not dependent on so not having money was um the least of it it was losing relationships mm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful point. The you connections. Know, yeah. I think what, what I'd like to do is maybe in this episode, because I think we have a sense of the, of the dive. Mm -hmm. And then in the next episode, come back and talk about getting your feet back on the ground, because it sounds like you went through a lot of different options from Harvard to Hogue Hospital, all over the place with recovery projects or programs. And there's, I'm sure, some really wonderful lessons there in terms of deciphering what worked, what didn't work. Um, and I think we need to explore that. So let's do that on the next episode here on Post Traumatic Driving, where we dive, survive, and thrive. The choice is yours. Thanks for supporting our podcast. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on your favorite social media. For books, merchandise, or to donate, visit coreiq.com. Post Traumatic Thriving is produced by Core IQ, a nonprofit with a mission to teach the life skills we all need but are not taught in school. Core IQ and the Post Traumatic Thriving podcast are for informational purposes only and do not provide medical or mental health advice. Always consult with your licensed medical and mental health care providers.